Good Shabbos, everyone. Shana Tova. I hope your fast has been a meaningful one. It's a strange phrase in Hebrew, Tzom Kal, which means an easy fast. The whole idea of, of, of Yom Kippur is um, for it to be hard. So um, we need food for thought. And this is the hour intentionally planned when our fasts are at their hardest. And I asked one Memphis native out of the 4,000 people in our congregation and one relative newcomer, because that's what makes Temple Israel such a beautiful blend of Memphians and newcomers. And this year's Yom Kippur speakers are so humble, I'm going to say it, because they would never think this way of themselves. These two reflect the best of us. Memphis native, Diane Goodman, who became Diane Goodman Sachs and was blessed to spend more than 50 joyful years married to Bob Vitalich, a blessed memory, has such a loving and large family. I haven't talked to Diane about this, but I think it's six children plus spouses, a dozen grandchildren, at least eight great-grandchildren. It's not a family, it's a dynasty. <laughs> Someone just told me, oh my gosh, I just played golf at Overton Park and the Abe Goodman, this daughter of Abe and Alice and sister of Pat's roots run deep. And I see the home crowd is here. How about the fact that Diane and Pat's father, Abe Goodman, I went to the archives, was born in Memphis in 1902. And the Goodman family has been the best of Temple ever since. I begged this Wellesley College and Rhodes sociology professor who lived at that iconic address, 3880 North Galloway Drive, to speak. She turned me down. Um, so I want to publicly thank her family and Paula and others for getting Diane to talk. <laughs> my one beef, I'll just say, my one beef with lifelong reformed Jews like Diane and another person, Harriet Stern of Blessed Memory, or Rabbi Dreyfus, your Jed Dreyfus, who was spoken of lovingly last hour, is that Jews like Diane and Harriet Stern of Blessed Memory and Jed, they don't consider themselves religious. When in this rabbi's book, they do more for bettering the lives around them than most rabbis, or as I once asked Harriet Stern, so who helped God heal the world more today? I who prayed and led services, or you who tutored children how to read in South Memphis? Diane reflects um, the depth and breadth of our congregation's roots and after her, a speaker who manifests the continuation of the talent, the mind, the understated gifts of the temple family members in our midst. My image of Eleanor Talley's Israeli household of classical musicians is the Israeli equivalent of the Von Tropp family. <laughs> with a mother, sisters, and brother-in-law on viola, with Eleanor, the gift who will speak after Diane, on her instrument, the cello. She is, in case you didn't know, this congregation's newest cantorial soloist. She'll be singing in the next hour at 2.30 in the sanctuary. She's not only a vocalist, songwriter, and performer, but a multi-instrumentalist as a pianist, guitarist, international blues performer, 
with her band, um, and this Israeli Canadian move to America, and miracle of miracles, thank God, met a Memphian named Corey Steinberg, whose own Allenberg Steinberg family roots here go back to Diane Goodman's family. When you talk about Allenberg, the best thing, and Steinberg, the best thing that can happen to a city like Memphis or a synagogue like Temple Israel is when a light like Elinor, do you know what Elinor means? My God is light. Best thing that could happen to a city or synagogue like ours is when a light like Elinor meets and marries Corey and brings not just one, but two additional lights into the world, a son Dylan, age four, and another radiant child, Lila, age two. I promise this will be the last you hear from me. Without further ado, Diane and Eleanor. Thank you, Micah. I don't know how much of that was, was money. Sorry. Brandon, yeah. can we turn this um, up? If not, I'll be doing it. Testing. Are we good? Okay. Again, thank you, Micah. Um, I don't know if I deserved all that, but it's always nice to hear. Um, I must begin by saying that I was amazed when Rabbi Micah invited me to speak today and to discuss what being Jewish men means to me. I've never thought of myself as being an active Jewish participant. I am not often at temple and have not been a consistent observer of the holidays. I even grew up in a home with a Christmas tree. My parents wanted me and, and my family to assimilate as much as humanly possible. We should live and act like everyone else. And yet, at the same time, my parents' world was totally Jewish. All their friends were Jewish. Their doctors were Jewish. Their lawyer was Jewish. Their grocer was Jewish. And yet, they taught me that Judaism was not an important part of my life. In looking back, however, as I begin to give it thought and, and as I try to prepare for this little talk, I realize that Judaism has played an enormous role in my life, both as a child and a young person in the 1940s and 50s and during my long adult years. I want to talk about this from two points of view. The first has to do with how I have fit into society, and the second has to do with my own private values and beliefs. As a former professor of sociology, always interested in the influence of groups, I will begin with the social. Being Jewish has always meant that I was part of a very special group. When I was younger, this involved some level of embarrassment. I was different. I learned early that there was some stigma involved. I remember as a schoolgirl saying, perhaps to my parents, that I never wished I wasn't Jewish but I did wish that everyone else was Jewish as well. <laughs> as I got older, I began to realize that I was part of a unique group. I could play Jewish geography with strangers I met. Those strangers, being Jewish, were already friends of mine. There was a connection. We were automatically distant cousins. We shared some linkage, and that was very important. As an adult, I had an experience that made this bond very clear to me. After we had retired, 
my husband and I traveled for several months in Asia. One day, at a zoo in Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia, we met another couple. They were from Australia, and we were going to Australia later during our travels. They suggested we call them when we come to Sydney. We did, and they invited us to have dinner with their family that Friday night. Fine. A son-in-law came to the hotel and picked us up at our, and we went to the home of our acquaintances. We walked in the door, and I saw a table set for Shabbat. I immediately started to cry. We had been away from home for a long time, and I had no hint that this couple, whose last name was Don, was Jewish, and neither did they have this knowledge of me. And yet, here in Australia, I had found an ancient tie to a family I had not known. We shared the important bond of being Jewish. I never forgot that evening. We had a connection with these strangers which was created thousands of years ago and had continued for all these years. These strangers were relatives of mine. That is part of what being Jewish has done for me. At the same time, there has been a tremendous change since my parents' days in where being Jewish places me in the, in the world. In the 1950s, I generally hoped that the subject of what religious group I belonged to would not come up in conversation. Now, living in a retirement home with currently only five Jewish residents, I am really happy and often eager to inject into conversations, I am Jewish and I think such and such. <laughs> this is part that, that this is a change in society that is wonderful and one that we must not overlook because of current controversies and fears. The second part of, be, of what being Jewish means to me is more private and personal. This begins with Rabbi Wax and what I learned from him in what we used to call junior congregation in the 1950s. Here, I first came to realize that being Jewish was a gift. As a teenager, I think I believed quite strongly in God. But what I learned from Rabbi Wax was that what I believed was not the most important thing, but what I did was extremely important. I should live my life as best I could, as God would want me to live. Choices should be made as if the moral God of Judaism were guiding me. Faith was never an important issue. Rabbi Wax taught me that the God of Judaism did not demand that I believed certain things, nor that I ignored what my reason told me. Rather, I should try to live according to the values Judaism taught, that those values were what was important. Judaism taught, and Judaism and being Jewish set some very high standards of behavior. I certainly didn't always meet those standards, but being Jewish made me sure I knew what those standards were. It influenced how I saw the world, how I thought about what was fair and just and what was not. It taught me to see the humanity in all people and to do the best I could both personally, to personally treat all people fairly, but also to try to make my family, my community, my country, my society, my world, a place where all people were treated equally, where all had a chance to share the goodness of God's world. And being Jewish has also provided me with comfort. 
Not only am I grateful for all the blessings that I have had, but the grounding in Judaism has given me something to hold on to in times of chaos and grief. My personal religious beliefs have helped me deal with an inexplicable world. The Jewish struggle to understand the incomprehensible has continued through so many centuries. That struggle has appeared in the Torah, in sermons, in junior congregation classes. It is required of us that we Jews continue to think, to study, to question, to seek to understand. The world has never been a perfect place. I doubt that Eden ever existed. But what Judaism requires of us sets a standard. We never really meet that standard. But being Jewish helps us see a path to follow, and that path gives us hope. We hope for that more perfect world, and we have a Jewish responsibility to work towards its existence. I will soon be 85 years old, and throughout my life, Judaism has offered me joy and guidance and support, and I really appreciate the opportunity that Rabbi Micah has given me to think about what Judaism has meant to me. Thank you so much, Rabbi Michael, for the opportunity. Thank you, Diana. That was beautiful and enlightening to listen to. Um, for those of you I don't know, I'm Eleanor Tali Steinberg, Israel's um, Temple Israel's newly cantorial soloist, just like Micah said, and excited to be here today to share a little bit of my experience and my perspective. Um, with the question of what does being Jewish mean to me, I guess we have to start at the beginning. I was born and raised in Israel with my two younger sisters to a Canadian mother, an Israeli father, who was born the day that his family arrived in Israel from Iraq. Both sides of my family has been through the classic Jewish story, very dramatic Jewish stories. My grandmother on the Canadian side was a Holocaust survivor. She is a Holocaust survivor, originally from Czechoslovakia, who made it to Canada after the war and there she married my Polish-Canadian grandfather after he returned from the war and fought in Europe for the Canadian Army. On my dad's side, my grandparents were forced to leave Iraq in 1951, as was the entire Jewish community of Iraq in those years, and all of their assets and possessions confiscated by the Iraqi government. My grandmother, my Safta, was nine months pregnant with my dad at the time, she had a two-year-old daughter, my aunt, and Safta went into labor and had my dad, as mentioned, on their day of arrival in Israel. This generational story was very normal, very common and familiar within my generation in Israel. All of my friends had similar family stories. When I was growing up in Israel, we of course learned a lot about the Jewish people, the Jewish values, Jewish history, one of the things we were taught in school that always resonated for me was that the Jewish people had a role, a purpose here on earth, being a light unto the nations. I remember wondering what that actually means. And it's only in recent years that I've started understanding that concept a little bit. The meaning of being Jewish is something vast in my experience, and it's also something that's constantly changing. It means one thing, or it meant one thing when I was growing up in Israel as a little girl with the Gulf War as the background of my formative memories when I was four years old. It meant more when I turned eight and remember very clearly the moment of understanding that in 10 years, I'm to be drafted to the Israeli army for my mandatory service in the IDF. Being Jewish meant even more when I was in middle school and started my Family Roots project at 12, interviewing my parents and grandparents and hearing more about their stories from Iraq 
Canada, and Europe. I kept deepening my understanding of being Jewish when we visited Poland in grade 11 for the trip, was, which was the Israeli equivalent of the March of the Living. The meaning of being Jewish certainly continued to evolve when I became an IDF soldier in intelligence in 2006. Then when I came to the US in 2013 and was welcomed with such warmth by a brand new community, the Memphis Jewish community, long before I ever thought I'd end up here, I'd stay, before I even met my husband, Corey, being Jewish turned into something totally new once again. The meaning of being Jewish in my experience is ever evolving. It's constantly renewing. And it's an aspect of us, of who we all are and what we're here to do that never stays still. So what does being Jewish mean to me now? And now, after the one year mark of October 7th, now while the war is still going with no end in visible sight, now as 100 and people, are still kept underground in horrid and humane conditions. Now in Memphis, during the high holidays, now as I start a new year and a new chapter here, now as Ima, mom, to my four and two-year-olds, Dylan and Lila, right now today, what being Jewish means to me, personally, is experiencing a split reality. A split reality, a situation in which Two contradicting realities happen simultaneously. That's been my experience, at least in the last year, if not more. Being physically far away from my family in Israel while they are going through the war, knowing relatives of hostages, relatives and bereaved families, checking every morning to make sure my sister and parents are not in the shelter, that my one month old nephew is not in the shelter, trying to get to Israel for the last five months with constant flight cancellations and missing my new nephew's delivery. But at the same time, being Jewish today and now means having a beautiful life in a warm community here in Memphis, being able to provide a safe and loving childhood for my small children, and recently joining Temple as a cantorial soloist, which allows me to use my musical experience while giving back to the community that's been giving to me so much over 11 years now. The thing is, this split reality doesn't only exist in my life. It feels like all of us have been experiencing this feeling of multiple realities happening simultaneously. In Israel, one very real reality is that families and communities are constantly torn apart by what feels like an endless cycle of war, violence, and trauma. Yet simultaneously, the level of support and teamwork in rebuilding repairing and healing continues to rise with the new organizations that are constantly being established over there to treat PTSD and physical trauma and rehabilitate individuals, families, communities, and even cities hit by rockets up north or ruined and set on fire in the south. Here in the U.S., the split reality is always present as on the one hand, we continue to move through a period of complete polarity and separatism which started before the war in Israel and has been made more extreme and frightening since October 7th, with anti-Israel and anti-Zionist protests and research that shows anti-Semitism peaking in American society. While at the same time, there's also a strong sense of solidarity, care, and compassion in light of the recent natural disasters in North Carolina, Tennessee, Florida, with outpouring support from pilots, businesses, celebrities, and the government providing all the help they can by raising donations and funding rehabilitation, care, and plans for rebuilding infrastructure. The examples of this split reality go on and on, which brings us to which reality do we choose to put our energy into? On one side of the spectrum, there is an axis of evil at play operated by the power hungry and the greedy, who are planting seeds of destruction and violence. On the other is community, empathy, and care. More and more people who are waking up to the future they want to build in order to create something new. When a group or a community holds on to a vision consistently for a certain period of time, they're able to create a new reality. A great example for that is Theodore Herzl, 
When Herzl envisioned a state for Jews, it was just an idea, a thought he held in his own mind's eye. Herzl and his peers, other philosophers and thought leaders in the Zionist movement, were the group that held on to a reality they wanted, an idea, a thought, a vision. And as they continued to foster that vision, they thought of it, they spoke of it, they felt their way through it, and eventually they acted on it and created a reality. The concept became a physical fact. Israel became a state for Jews. So what do we wish to create for our children, our grandchildren, and for ourselves? What is our vision for the future? When we look at the war and the many horrible events happening all over the US and the world, it's hard to believe anything positive could grow from so much violence, trauma, and dysfunction. But one sentence that's been giving me clarity through this whole thing is a quote from my teacher, Luharia, of Luharia Center, Home for Transformation, an Israel-based organization I've been studying with for five years now. Quote, we cannot light up dark places if meeting the darkness blows out our own light. One thing I've learned in my studies is that moving through the pain is a critical step on the way to resilience and hope. If we don't let ourselves feel the pain and move through it, we can develop despair. We can lose hope. And that could lead to indifference and more and more struggle. If we allow ourselves to feel and move through the trauma and the pain that time brings with it, we will create the capacity within us to focus our energy on a vision, a vision for our future, allowing ourselves to move through the fear, the trauma, the pain, both personally and as a community, will also allow us to build resilience, mental resilience, emotional resilience, and social resilience, the resilience we need to keep the light on in the darkness. The truth about this war is that it's a part of a greater war, a global war. It's a war fought over the public's consciousness. Those who plant seeds of polarity and separatism do so by categorizing reality for us in a polarizing manner, for and against. And by doing so, they manage to create the war between people, the war of pro and anti. How do we stop them from this polarization, from stealing and engineering the public's consciousness? The opposite of categorizing reality as for and against, black and white, is finding a common reality, a common truth, so what's our common reality as Jews, as Americans or Israelis, as a Western society, as a human society sharing this planet and coexistence? Our common reality, our common denominator is our shared values. There are values we all share and agree upon unequivocally. So the solution to this war waged on our consciousness is one we've always had right in the palm of our hands, in our community, for thousands of years. Our Jewish values, which are not only Jewish values, they're global and universal values. They're values of freedom, of the sanctity of life and liberty, the value of equality, the value of avoiding le shon hara, the purity of the word, the purity of the heart, of the thought, the purity of the intention, the value of giving a personal example and living our values, walking the talk, or as described in Judaism, being a light unto others. The value of responsibility, accountability. These are values we can all agree on, and that is the solution to the separatism and polarity, finding the common denominator, finding the common truth. The archetype of being a light unto the nations by making choices based on the values we all believe in goes beyond the Jewish people. It expresses our ability to connect and unify, our ability to inspire others, our ability to resonate a message, a higher perspective. More and more moments of our day, we live and renew the values that we all believe in. It's the ability to constantly continue to reach new peaks, new and higher levels of humanity. Our values are the key 
to the path of light, to keeping our light on in the darkness, to finding our vision for the future, to raising our children and their children with hope and with a compass. I'm a firm believer that it's always the darkest before dawn. And as a people, we have known immensely dark times in the past, which opened windows of opportunity for the impossible to become possible. Nothing is done, sealed, and final. The horizon is vast and open ahead of us. And it's up to us to be a light, first internally unto ourselves, then to our immediate connections, then unto our community, and then unto the world. We are the people we've been waiting for, and we've always had the answers within. So what does Jewish, being Jewish mean to me today, now? It means being the light in the darkness and not letting the darkness ever blow out that light. One of the best parts of this hour, and all of you watching, but especially those of you in Nelson Wax Hall, is you may not have known the stories of the people in the same family you're a part of, Temple Israel. Such articulate voices both of you are, and such rich food for thought you've given all of us. So, one more time, Eleanor and Diane. So I'm still learning. I used to do questions and answers, and someone said, just let people schmooze, Rabbi. So that's what we're going to do. If you want to talk to Diane and Eleanor, they will be here. And at 2.30, Eleanor and Ruach will be singing in the sanctuary. If you don't want music and you want to study with one of the great Torah teachers, Dr. Joe Levy. Shabbat shalom, everyone. Meaningful fast to each of you.